Tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and Harvard University's Rappaport Institute and the Taubman Center, I am excited to introduce Edward Glazer to discuss his latest book, Triumph of the City. In memorable and convincing fashion, Glazer reveals the overlooked successes within city life. He deftly explores the historical and geographical threads that create an economic heartland out of our major metropolitan areas. Glazer highlights Cambridge as a skilled city that reinvented itself into a knowledge-oriented industry after the decline of its candy industry. After reading Glazer's book, a New York Times reviewer, quote, walked away dazzled by the greatness of cities and fascinated by this writer's nimble mind, close quote. Edward Glazer joined the Harvard University Economics Department in 1992 and is the current Fred and Eleanor Gimp Professor of, of Economics. He is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor to City Journal. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Edward Glazer. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. I, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you were uh, able to take, take time out and to miss the battle between Watson and, and the, Jeopardy, uh, uh, the Jeopardy champions to actually uh, to come, come talk, talk with me about, about my book. I, I also just really want to thank Harvard Bookstore for doing this. I have spent many happy hours here and, and uh, far too, uh, or not far too much, probably far too little money relative to what I, what I should have bought of, of books, but I certainly have a large number of non-cashed in credits for those, for the discount, the discount things that are sitting around my, my, my home. Um, and I certainly love the uh, innovativeness and, and connection with the community that this bookstore certainly, certainly has. Um, the, at the heart of my book lies a paradox. And the paradox is that we live in an age in which communication and transportation costs have vanished away to nothingness. We live during an era in which it is effortless to telecommunicate to any part of the globe where we could all sit at home in some sylvan spot and connect with people anywhere. There's no obvious reason why we actually have to cluster next to each other in cities, and yet we do. And yet we choose proximity. Just recently, more than half the world moved into, moved into urban areas. We crossed that 50% percent line. In America, after going through some very tough times in the 1970s, cities are, are back, centers of enormous productivity, centers of innovation, centers of cultural change, places that are marked by fun as much as by productivity. And this is, this is a remarkable thing that we, that we are experiencing. You know, if the rest of the, of the country was as productive as the New York metropolitan area, our GDP would rise by 43 percent, the gulf between, between urban metropolitan productivity and, and productivity elsewhere in the country is so, is so large. Cities have also come back at places of pleasure as, as well as fun, and those are also things that I talk about uh, as I talk about it in the book. I think the reason why, and, and that's I think the central theme of the book, the reason why cities remain so important is that what globalization and new technologies have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've increased the returns to new ideas. They've increased the returns to knowledge. Because today we no longer play on a completely local playground because we actually, if we have a new idea, we can sell it on the other spot of the world. We can make it uh, someplace else. We can connect with everyone throughout the planet. And because of that, knowledge is more important than ever. Well, we, how do we get smart? At our heart, we're a social species that gets smart by hanging around other smart people. We come out of the womb with this remarkable ability to sop up information from the people around us. Everyone in Cambridge knows this, I think. I think this should not be a surprise to any one of you. That's what this city does and always has done. It's what my employer, Harvard, is supposed to do when it works well, right, is to connect smart people who learn from one another, right? We faculty members like to pretend that we have something to do with the learning process, but let's be honest. I mean, what's mostly going on is that smart students are educating each other just by being next to each other and, and just by learning from one another. And in some sense, the, the most, the reason why, you know, these, these new, the face-to-face -face contact is so important is that face-to-face -face contact is most important for co communicating complicated ideas. Anyone who teaches knows that the hard part of teaching is not knowing your subject matter. It's not repeating words that you've read on the page. It's knowing whether or not your audience gets it. It's knowing whether or not the students that you're talking to actually are understanding what, you, what you're getting. I find it almost impossible to do that long distance via, via a telecommunicating device of some form. Unless I can actually have some sense about the, the facial expressions of the eyes of the people that I'm communicating with, I certainly find it almost impossible to have a, a meaningful conversation that con co communicates anything really complicated. Face-to-face -face contact in cities is also particularly important because of the 
incredibly important happenstance learning. Think about a, a young worker who goes to work at the Harvard Bookstore, goes to work at uh, Google, goes to work at Goldman Sachs. Um, what they learn is only to a certain extent what happens in their actual training sessions. That's a relatively minor portion of the human capital that they're going to accumulate. The important stuff is what they're going to be picking up by looking at people around them, things that were never being intended to teach. But in fact, they pick up because they were there, because they were in the maelstrom uh, of, of events. And if you, it's no accident that, in fact, the most technologically sophisticated industry in America all right, is actually the mo also the most famous example of geographic concentration. That Silicon Valley, which of all the industries in the world has the ability to connect across space, young software engineers need to be there. They want to be in the center of the action physically because that's where they learn how to be successful over the, long, over the long run. Now, the success of cities is even more obvious in the developing world. It's even more obvious in places like Mumbai and Shanghai and Bangkok, where cities are providing a path out of poverty into prosperity. It's obvious right now in the streets of Cairo, where it feels as if almost the whole future of the world is held in, in the balance as what's going on on a city streets. It's been called a Facebook revolution, of course. And in a sense, it is. No one can deny the important role that, that technology played in making that revolution occur. But you wouldn't be able to topic Mubarak just by blocking him on Facebook. You know, you actually had to have, put people on the street to push change. And that's the sort of remarkable thing that we're seeing, is that while there were earlier periods in which declining transportation actually cre cost created the, the troubled days in the 1970s, today we're in a world in which new technologies are actually making face-to-face -face contact and cities more vital than ever. To get a sense of this arc, I, I'd like to actually just take us back a little bit in history and have some sense about how we got here and what changed. I'm going to tell this, this story a little bit through the, through the lens of Boston, since we are actually a greater Boston, since we, since we are here. Although in the book, I also tell it through the, the stories of Detroit and, and New York, and I'll reference those as well. Boston, of course, has a almost 400-year-old year, year old history. It, it's formed, as all of America's older, colder cities are, on a, on a waterway. Every one of America's 20 largest cities in 1900 was on, a, was on a major waterway, from the oldest, like Boston and New York, which were on spots where the river meets the sea, to the newest, Minneapolis, at the northernmost navigable point on the Mississippi, on St. Anthony's Falls. Um, Boston has a problem from its inception. Right? It, it forms without a natural comparative advantage. Right? The, the, climate in New England is just too close to the climate in Old England to have any natural commodity like tobacco or sugar that can be shipped across. And because of this lack, because the city formed for you know, the desire for, you know, economists like to call it, like to differentiate consumer cities from producer cities. It clearly wasn't a producer city since it didn't have an obvious production advantage. Now, I think Winthrop would have talked about the, you know, the ability to attain eternal salvation as being something different than consumption. But just accept that as, you know, the economist way of making everything that's, uh, that's divine and soaring somewhat pedantic. Um, but um, it forms without any obvious comparative advantage. And so century after century, Boston has to struggle to figure out how it can cover its, you know, how it can cover its needs, how it can cover its needs by imported key imported manufactured goods like guns and Bibles, right? Those are, those are pretty vital for your, for your 17th century uh, uh, Boston, Boston resident, and they're not being made here initially first. So you've got you've to figure out something to export. Well, in the 1630s, Boston operates as sort of a colonial era Ponzi scheme, right? Where each new resident sells basic commodities to, uh, sorry, each, the older resident sell basic commodities to the newer residents at vastly inflated prices. You know, basic stuff, food, land, wood stock, the things you need when you're just coming off the boat. And the people who are coming off the boat have a little bit of gold which covers their, uh, covers their loss. That's appropriate enough because, of course, Ponzi himself was a Bostonian. Uh, but um, this fails, as Ponzi schemes also fail, uh, always fail. And in the 1640s, Boston has to look for something new. The flow of immigrants is cut off, of course, by the, by the English Civil War, which gives those, uh, those Puritans a, an idea that they can at attain their own salvation right home in England without having to cross the, the Atlantic to, to achieve it. So Boston has to figure out something new. And what comes to Boston's rescue is the, the triangle trade, which really meant this sort of strange mixture where Boston would ship basic commodities down south, Woodstock, grain, livestock, fish, a lot of fish, uh, 
uh, down to the cash crop colonies, they would then ship tobacco, sugar, cotton uh, to England, and England would ship manufactured goods to Boston. This occurs purely by happenstance, as things in, in cities normally do, when a, when a ship from Barbados comes north during a famine, desperately looking for some food. And while Boston didn't have much to, to offer, it did have some food, and, and thereby this thing begins. So during the 17th century, Boston thrives at this, as the center of this shipping empire. And it thrives based on three things that continue to be the mainstay of cities today. Small firms, smart people, global connections. Right? This, is, this is the heart of the pre-industrial city, and it, it main t continues to be the heart of successful cities in the, in the 21st century. But of course, other cities are able to pick up on our game. There's nothing preventing New York, which has a deeper river and better farmland, or Philadelphia from doing the same thing. And we've got a tough 18th century when those cities pass, New pass us, playing exactly the same, the same game. You know, our merchants get so disgruntled that some revolutionary historians have argued that, that, the, that the war represented the unhappiness of the merchants, that our relative economic decline, that the revolution represented it. What is clear is that the revolution represented the capacity of cities to connect smart people and enable urban mobs to change history as they have just now in Cairo, right? You know, John Hancock wanted change to British mercantilist policies and wanted to foment a movement that would push that. Sam Adams you know, may not have cared that much about these policies, but he knew how to conjure a mob, right? as, as many people in the alcohol business uh, know. Um, the, um, the combination of the two, the two men brought together by Boston's dense, dense corridors, are able to start this remarkable uh, event of, of uh, making America. And I think one of the themes of the book that's so important is that there's nothing that drives me crazier than, than the notion that cities are somehow or other decaying, corrupt, and un-American. Right? Cities played a crucial role from the start to, the, to start to today in making America what it is. And there's no sense in which anyone should ever accept that the American dream can only lie behind a white picket fence in, in the suburbs. But after the tough 18th century, Boston manages to reinvent itself yet again. And the key technological change is the move from smaller ships to bigger ships. And this enables a, a global empire of commerce that, that Bostonians are able to take advantage of because, again, they're smart, because they have people with these great shipping and sailing uh, skills, both from the high end, the, the merchants who are able to design this network, to the people on the ground who are able to, to, work, to work the ships. This is the age of the China trade. This is the age of trade with South Africa. It's the age of, of whaling, right? A great empire that's dominated by the skills that we have in, in Boston. <laughs> And this is an era in which we're exporting remarkable talent, much of it that's actually nurtured originally like by, the, by the China trade. So building the great network that made the wealth of America, uh, the wealth of America's hinterland accessible to the East required extraordinary investments. Some of them made by New Yorkers like DeWitt Clinton and, and the Erie Canal. Some of them made by Bostonians like John Murray Forbes, uh, uh, a distant relative, of course, of Senator Kerry's, uh, who was a, made a fortune in the China trade, going over as a, as a young man and being involved in those great healthy, healthy enterprises like opium, uh, which were, of course, so central to uh, uh, these fortunes. Um, and he took his money and invested it in both abolitionist causes and building railroads. He actually built the first railroad that connected to, to Chicago from the east. Right? Those rails supplemented the water network that had already, already built, that actually made America. Uh, you know, the cowboys couldn't have existed without the merchants in, in Boston or the, the shippers in, in Chicago. And um, you know, a, a fact that I like is that in 1816, at the start of this era, it cost as much to move goods 32 miles over land as it did to have them cross the Atlantic which is why America perched on the edge of the eastern seaboard, connected by the lifeline of the Atlantic Ocean. But over the 19th century, we built the canals, we built the railroad, we made this you know, in immensely rich hinterland accessible. And Bostonians were a huge part of that. Now, Boston in the mid-19th century had another crisis hit it. And the crisis was steam, right? All that sales-specific skills uh, lost their value when you know, we moved over to steam. And Boston reinvented itself once again, this time very much around steam engines, right? around the rail hub that Boston had become, and also around a, a you know, invigorated urban manufacturing process. right? So the, the early steps in the American Industrial Revolution happened in lower density areas. Um, because of the advantages of water power, and because you needed those waterways to power the, power the, the, the mills. Uh, as our steam engines became more powerful, you were able to move that stuff into, into cities with less need for that vast suburban infrastructure. And the industrial city was, was born. Um, 
in some sense, the industrial city was a detour, I think, from what cities are at their heart. And I want to sort of take you just momentarily to Detroit to sort of just think about this. If you think about Detroit, one of those, you know, inland ports, one of those great inland waterways, in the 19th century, it is again a city of smart people, small firms and connections to the outside world. Detroit in 1900 bears a staggeringly close resemblance to Silicon Valley in the 1970s. There's a genius on every street corner, all of which are borrowing each other's ideas, or stealing if you prefer, uh, supplying them with, with finances, supplying them with inputs, a remarkably fertile, competitive, entrepreneurial place. Right? Everyone struggling to come up with a new, new thing, which in this case, of course, is the ability to produce a cheap car, right? a cheap car. And you know, Ford does it. Um, but the tragedy, of course, of Detroit, or the tragedy at least for the city of Detroit, cheap cars did a lot of good for a lot of people, but the tragedy was that, that it, it transformed the city in a way that was unlike the city's past and unlike the city's future. It moved from having these small firms, smart people, connections to the outside world to something that looked like Ford's River Rouge plant, right? Think about the sort of vast scale of, of River Rouge, vast walls closing the, the plant out from the outside world. And also the fact that Ford's genius enabled people with relatively little formal education to be enormously productive, which is great, which is a great thing that Ford was able to, was able to, to do that. And yet the downside of this is that Detroit became a very unskilled city, at least by formal education, right? 11% of Detroit's population today has a college degree, uh, which is an enormously low number, certainly relative to, to, uh, to, to Boston, um, and relative to the country, which is more like 27.5%. Um, and this change proved something that was made it very, very difficult when the manufacturing model failed, as it did everywhere. So Boston thrived for 80, 90 years as a manufacturing city. But the decline in transportation costs hit Boston just as much as it hit Buffalo or Detroit or New York, right? That in fact, if you were about making cheap standardized products, you could make them more cheaply somewhere else other than our colder, older cities once transportation costs became low enough. So manufacturing moved. It moved out to the suburbs. It moved to right to work states. It moved across the ocean to places with cheaper labor. That's a process that's not changing, right? In terms of producing standardized goods, it's very, very hard to imagine how places like Boston are ever going to be cost efficient in terms of, in terms of doing that. Um, and these, this exodus, this deindustrialization, was an enormously difficult challenge for cities like Boston to, to face. And if you think back to Boston in the 1970s, in the era of busing, in the era of, in our era of unemployment, it's hard to imagine it now, but a great majority of the city's housing stock was priced in 1980 at less than the physical cost of construction, right? It cost, it cost, if the houses had fallen down, it wouldn't have paid to rebuild them, right? Th that number, by the way, is 90% in Detroit today. 90% of the houses in Detroit today, if they fell down, it wouldn't, pay to, it wouldn't pay to rebuild them. New York in the 1970s, where I grew up, was, was enormously hard hit by the deindustrialization. The largest industrial cluster in the, in the post-war uh, US was not automobiles in Detroit. It was the garment industry in New York. The garment industry in New York was slammed, hammered, destroyed by, by the, the decline in transportation costs, by the, the move of, of these jobs elsewhere. And yet some of these cities managed to come back and others did not. And uh, the, the argument that I make in the book is that what made the difference for urban revitalization was smart, skilled, entrepreneurial people. And that cities like Detroit and our federal government erred severely in privileging physical investment in declining places over investment in people. And that in some sense, the great tragedy of Detroit was not that the city declined. It was going to decline. Its model was troubled. Cities rise, cities fall, cities have shocks all the time. The tragedy is that they decided to fix it with building new buildings and a monorail that glides over essentially empty streets. Right? The hallmark of declining cities is they've got plenty of structures relative to people and relative to the level of demand. You don't need a monorail if you don't have a problem driving around the city. Doesn't make any sense. Okay? Um, you know, what Detroit needed was better schools for its children. What Detroit needed was that every child growing up in the city needed the opportunity to be safe, needed the opportunity to actually accumulate the human capital that would have enabled them to be successful somewhere else. Now, uh, Boston and other uh, more educated cities had an advantage. They were able to reinvent themselves once again, this time from manufacturing cities to cities that are capitals of the information age. Now, Boston for you know, 
very odd reasons, right? In, in part because John Winthrop saw, you know, feared some great Jesuit conspiracy and saw the need to invest in education as a bulwark against the kingdom of the Antichrist. I think that's his exact words. Uh, conveniently, of course, the Jesuits have helped Boston in two ways educationally, one of which is by producing their own first-rate college, and second of all, by scaring the wits out of John Winthrop. Uh, the, um, the, the, um, but, you know, Boston has this, this, uh, has this long-standing fetish, fetish for education, and it's proven to be enormously valuable, right? I mean, it proved enormously valuable when Arthur D. Little uh, of MIT set up his consulting uh, lab 100 years ago. It proved to be enormously valuable when Ned Johnson took over Fidelity and started making a fetish of research in, in Fidelity. It proved to be enormously valuable when uh, Ann Wang started making his computers in the, 19, in the 1950s, and it has proven to be enormously valuable valuable in biotech today. And, you know, if you look at the stories of the firms that enabled Boston to come back, it shows, again, the remarkable ability of cities to connect diverse people who bring together different skills, different insights, and play off each other's ideas. So uh, think about Boston Scientific, right? This strange combination of John Abiel, perfectly sensible entrepreneur, smart guy, visionary leader of, of a corporate sense with Itzhak Bentoff, right? Uh, Itzhak Bentoff, inventor of Slen Slenderoni. Uh, inventor of this model of the expanding Big Bang, I think it is. I'm not sure. I've never understood exactly what this is. But more importantly, the guy also invented a steerable catheter, right? And and these two people, this very strange, you know, very brilliant inventor and this very standard entrepreneur, are connected by Boston. I can tell a similar story about you know what happens with the, with the rise of Medtronic in in Minneapolis, of sort of smart people being being connected. And this is what brings Boston back. This is what brings New York back as well. New York has this added advantage of having this culture of entrepreneurship that's generated by its, its uh, garment industry. So if you look at the variables that predict the ability of cities to come back, older, colder cities to come back, none is more powerful than education. Look at the share of the population with college degrees in 1970. It's an enormously powerful predictor of which cities have managed to turn themselves around. On average, if, as you look across metropolitan areas today, as the share of the area's population with a college degree increases by 10%, the average wages rise for the wages of an average person rise by eight percent, holding their skills constant, holding their years of education constant. Right? This is you know being around smart people just makes you more productive. And one of the ways that we you know know how this works is it's not as if you immediately get higher wages when you come to a place like Boston. What happens is your wage profile slopes upward. You get you get higher wages over time, which is compatible at least with the view that what these cities are doing are enabling the the learning of skills. They're acting as forges uh, of human capital. They're also, of course, skilled workers are also acting as entrepreneurs. They're making other people more productive by figuring out how to make them more skilled. And those cities that have a tradition of entrepreneurship have also benefited, have also managed to uh, excel as, uh, as cities of the, of the information age. And, you know, if, this is the, the comparison, say, of, of natural resource-based cities, which developed very large firms, think U.S. Steel, that were very counter to a culture of entrepreneurship. Those places have done very poorly relative to places with very small average firm sizes. And uh, one of the arguments for Detroit, for, for New York's resilience is the garment industry was huge, but it was filled with small operators. It was a, a stepping point for thousands of little guys uh, to get started in the business of being an entrepreneur. The, in the book, I tell the story of A.E. Lefcourt, the remarkable builder who created more skyscrapers than anyone else did in New York prior to the great, great crash. He got his start in the garment trade. He got his start because he could, at the age of 25, buy out his boss with a relatively limited amount of capital. Actually, he didn't really get his start in the garment trade. He got his real start shining shoes and selling newspapers. But once he moved from that, he got his he got start in, in the garment trade. Sanford Weil, right, the guy behind Shearson Lehman and then Citibank. His father was in the garment industry, right? His father was a garment entrepreneur as, as well, right? These, these skills seem to be something that's passed down as, as people who are self-employed tend to have self-employed, uh, tend disproportionately to have self-employed uh, children as well. And that, I think, reminds us of the fact that, you know, when we talk about skills, shares of the population with college degrees is a, you know, is an easy measure. It's a census measure. But the most important skills that happen in cities have nothing to do with what you learn in school, as much as it pains me as a college teacher to admit it, right? I mean, the important skills are the intangible things which are picked up from people around you, and that's what, what, makes, cities, uh, what makes cities so special. And based on this, we've seen this, you know, remarkable rise of of cities in the in the U.S., remarkable rise of skilled cities like like Boston that look in many ways, despite the recession, as healthy as they've ever been. And I think as America looks forward, 
as we look forward to some form of economic renewal. That economic renewal is not going to come from, you know, hiring lots of guys to put in infrastructure in the middle of low-density America. It's going to come from being smarter. It's going to come from having new ideas. It's going to come from outthinking the other places on the planet. And the way that we get smart is being around other smart people. And our schools are part of this, and there's no question that I think that investing in human capital is as important as anything that America can do, and investing in our children is, is as important as anything can do, anything America can do, can do. But it also depends on our cities. It depends upon smart people being together and innovating in, in our urban areas. But as important and as successful as cities are in America, the biggest action in urban life, of course, today is not in America. It's in the developing world. It's in India. It's in China. It's in South America. It's in the places where cities are just transforming cultures overnight. Gandhi, who of course you know we all correctly revere, but Gandhi was incredibly wrong on this. Of course, you know Gandhi had had a, had a line which is quoted in the book about it, the future of India being in its towns and villages, not in its not in its cities. He wasn't right. The future of India is in its cities. Right? And I think that's, that's absolutely obvious today, that in fact, you know, India is not going to offer a, a brighter future for its children if it stays in rural poverty. And in fact, cities like Mumbai and Bangalore uh, and, uh, and Delhi are the places that are allowing India to transform itself. Um, and they're, you know, uh, getting, these, getting the urban policies right in, in India and China are, in some sense, the biggest questions of the 21st century. You know, one of the things that, that troubles me as I look around, as, as I listen to discourse on the cities of the developing world, is how often people look at the problems, the very real problems of these areas, <laughs> and just wish that these cities would go away. They look at the poverty that exists in a place like Mumbai and they say, oh my goodness, this is a horrendous thing. Shouldn't we just, you know, you know block growth of Mumbai because these people's lives are so tough? You know, their lives are tough and poverty is always horrendous. But those people are there for a reason, okay? And there's a lot to like about urban poverty, by which I mean there's not a lot to like about poverty ever. But the fact that those poor pe people are living in cities is not a sign that cities are screwing up. It's actually a sign that cities are succeeding. Okay? Because cities don't make people poor. Cities attract poor people. And they attract poor people with a promise of economic opportunity. In the U.S., they attract poor people with the, with the ability to get around without a car for every adult. One study of mine that I, I discuss in the paper um, looked at the impact of building subway stops, building rail stops, on poverty in local neighborhoods. Well, you build a subway stop in lots of, these, lots of the cities throughout the country, poverty rates in adjoining areas went up. Okay. Does that mean there's anything miraculously terrible about subways that are making people poor? Of course not. Okay. It's about the silliest thing I could imagine. Right? It's that people who actually don't have a lot of money aren't, aren't able to afford a car for every, every person in their area. They actually choose to locate near a subway stop. That's a sign that a subway stop is doing something good. It's a sign that a subway stop is providing something valuable. Right? The same thing is true of the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. The same thing is true of the, of the slums of Mumbai. They have a future. The people who move to these areas have a future that, that they could never have in the rural northeast of Brazil because there they are connected. They're connected to the, the outside world. There's a future for them there that could never exist in rural poverty. And as tough as urban life can, can be and as tough as life in the favelas, favelas are, the people have chosen to be there for a very understandable reason. And the key is to make their lives better, not to somehow or other wish that we could all go back to some pastoral existence because there's no future in the stagnation of rural poverty. Cities bring change. And in the poorest places of the world, change is what they need. They do not need stasis. They do not need to go back to millennia of poverty and, and vast levels of infant mortality. That is not meant to deny that when you cram a lot of people into a very small area, there are problems. There are downsides of density. They're what economists call externalities. If I'm close enough to an exchange an idea with you face to face, I, I am unfortunately enough close enough to infect you with something. Uh, don't worry, I'm actually quite healthy right now. Uh, but um, if I'm close enough to, you know, hand you a book, I'm actually also close enough to rob you, which is something I'm also not planning on doing. Um, but this, these you know, costs, of, costs of proximity are real, and they require public intervention. They're not something that the free market makes go away. And I think there's a reason why people in New York or Boston are considerably fonder of government than people living in Montana. Right? They need government more. They always have. Right? And that's a, that's a very real thing that the, that the, book, you know, the book addresses. And I talk about a, a number of the great challenges, both congestion, crime, and um, crime and clean water. 
And clean water is, in a sense, the, the most important job of any city government. And it's, in some sense, the greatest failure of the, of the, Indian, uh, of the Indian cities today. Um, clean water you know, reflected enormous investments by American cities. Uh, the, if you go back to, to 1800, there was a, a debate between a private and public response to the, the problem of, of water in the US. And, and in, in New York, a somewhat unholy combination of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. I make it clear, I, I have enormous respect for Alexander Hamilton. But this was not his finest hour. Uh, Burr and Hamilton, Hamilton went along with Burr's idea that they were not going to produce uh, public waterworks. There was great demand for this in the wake of the, the cholera epidemics that had swept through, not cholera, it would have been yellow fever in the, in the 1790s, that swept through America's cities in, in, that, in that era. So both New York and Philadelphia were continuing a response, considering the response. Philadelphia spent the money, put in public waterworks under Latrobe. It worked quite well. The Burr-Hamilton combination came up with this idea of a subsidized private producer the Manhattan Water Company. It was Burr's idea. Hamilton, Hamilton went along with it. Hamilton convinced the Federalist City Council of New York, which was not prone to go along with, with Burr of, of, uh, of Tammany, of you know, the leader of Tam, their Tammany Hall opponents. He convinced them that by building public waterworks, he, they would be laying themselves on for burthensome taxes. That's, that was the exact word that Hamilton used, burthensome taxes. Um, and instead, they subsidized the Manhattan Water Company. They subsidized the Manhattan Water Company by giving it the ability, which was a rare ability then, to operate as a bank. Okay, so what, what resulted? Burr got his bank and the Manhattan Water Company operated. It didn't produce much clean water. And it did a little, but really not very much. It certainly doesn't seem to have actually done any, any of a job in what it was supposed to do. It did prove to be a very successful bank, though. It, it is, in fact, still with us. Its name is J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a longstanding success. But New York didn't get clean water until it invested in the Croton Aqueduct until it actually spent an enormous amount of money. And those types of investments were critical in stopping cities from being killing fields. At the start of the 20th century, a boy born in New York City could expect to live seven years less than a boy born elsewhere in the country. Okay? Today, lifespans in places like New York and Boston are higher than the national average. That didn't happen by chance. That happened with large investments. And the most important of these investments were, were, water, were water works. At the start of the 20th century, cities in the US were spending more on water than the federal government was spending on anything except for the army and the post office. This was an enormous undertaking. Of course, urban health was also created by, by something that I've, I've called um, self-protecting urban innovation. And of course, the famous example of that is Dr. Snow of London, who actually used the information that was generated by the cases of cholera around him to figure out the source of cholera. He says the father of epidemiology. And cities often have the ability to create, through you know, the provision of knowledge, the solutions to their own, their own problems. The case of water required an engineering solution. But there are some problems, some of the urban problems, that actually need economics as well as engineering. So congestion is one of those. Now, We've tried to build our way out of congestion for a long time, but it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for something that the economists, something that economists Gilles Duranton and Matt Turner have called the fundamental law of traffic congestion, which is that vehicle miles traveled, okay, the amount of time cars are on the road, r rises roughly one for one with the amount of highways and roads built, okay? That if you build more roads, more cars are going to drive on them, which means that any time you just try to build your way out of the traffic problem, you just get more driving. The solution for this, of course, as any economist will tell you, and there are some in, in, in the room, is you got to price things. You actually can't give stuff away or else they get abused. Okay? So you know, it's sort of like New York and Boston are running a, you know, a Soviet-style trans transport system. And by that, I mean, of course, that in the old Soviet Union, they used to underprice goods. They used to give out food for way below prices and then let queues clear the market, right? So that people would stand long periods online. Well, that's kind of how a crowded city street works, is that the price is set at zero and people wait on wait online forever. On the other hand, in places like London and Singapore that have moved to a more rational system where we actually charge people for the social cost of their action, traffic has substantially um, has substantially declined and, and congestion congestion works. I'll skip the story of crime now, which is a more which is a more difficult one. Um, but it's certainly true that that part of making the cities of, of the world livable has been has been dealing with the significant crime problems. The result of these changes, the result of these investments in creating a healthier, cleaner, safer city, is that cities are allowed to uh, to be their advantages as places of pleasure. Uh, have become as obvious as their advantages of places of productivity. And we, when we think about the comeback of Boston and New York over the past 20 years, it's 
only partially about the fact that they are engines that make us you know, more productive. It's also because cities are fun. It's also because the same power of innovation and competition that actually you know, works in terms of, of software companies also works for restaurants. Okay? It's because the same ability of people to learn from one another and, and create new ideas also creates excitement in the arts. One of the stories that I tell in the book is about this sort of intellectual maelstrom in 16th century London, where, where Marlowe and Shakespeare and Kidd and all of these you know, brilliant playwrights stole ideas from one another and borrowed from one another and did something absolutely magnificent in the, in the history of humankind. Right, this sort of sort of collective creativity, which you know made London more fun. Part of the reason, of course, that could work is that cities have enough scale to cover the fixed costs of things like theaters and museums, which is another urban advantage. And that scale, of course, enables cities to provide more specialized products. Right? I mean, you can get four different types of Indian food within three blocks of this this store. Right? From different different regions. Whereas in low density places, you end up you can end up eating something that's vaguely called continental cuisine. Uh, I'm, not, I'm never exactly sure which continent this is, but, but it, it is clear there's not a lot of specialization in one particular uh, form of, of eating. Um, the, the downside of urban success, of course, is that cities have also become expensive, too expensive, in fact. And this is unavoidable, in a sense, if you don't allow supply to keep up with demand. Right. So uh, the way I frame this in, in, in the book is that much of, the, much of what I know about cities, much of the wisdom of the book, owes, owes a great deal to the wisdom of the great Jane Jacobs, who knew cities because you walked their streets and had just tremendous insights about how city, cities worked. But uh, she did, from my perspective, make a mistake. And her mistake was being opposed to building up. She was actually right about the high rise, the high rise buildings of the, of, the, of the public projects. But I think she was wrong about opposing building up when it was privately developed and voluntarily done. Um, and the reason why I think she was wrong about this is that I think she did, was, in fact, misled by her ground level observation. So she noticed that old buildings were cheap and new buildings were expensive. And this led Jacobs to conclude that the way to keep space cheap was to actually stop any building of new buildings and to allow you know, the old buildings to remain. Well, that's not how supply and demand works. Okay? If you actually have demand for an area, if it grows because the city is productive, because the city is fun, you've actually got to supply more units. You've actually got to supply more space. Otherwise, the city becomes a, a boutique town, affordable only to the, to, the, you know, to the world's wealthy. And this is the kind of thing that I'm terribly afraid is, can be happening in cities like New York and Boston. Right, is that in fact without building we actually don't make the city inclusive to, to new people. Look at Jane Jacobs' own beloved Greenwich Village. Right? It was a place when she was there that was affordable to people like her at the start, middle income people. Who the, what the heck middle income person is able to afford a townhouse in Greenwich Village today? Right? It's been protected, it's been preserved, it's been kept old, right? and it now costs $5 million as an, as an entry point for a, for a home. Right? The way that you provide affordable housing is by building up right, in, a, in a dense area. Right? And this is the cranes of Chicago keep Chicago affordable by building large, no, large amounts of, of residential space. And that's, you know, I, I think some of the more controversial things that I have, have to say in, in, in the book. But I also, in fact, think that there are places in which we've gone too far with preservation. And I'll just talk briefly about this, that, you know, I revere the older buildings of our cities. And I love nothing more than when I'm reminded of the past of a place by uh, observing and touching its architecture. But cities are not meant to be museums. Okay? Cities need to change. And I, I also think some of the most interesting pieces of cities is when there's a dialogue across centuries between new architects and old architects. And I think it's you know, absolutely vital that we allow our cities to change and we allow new genius to, to express itself in, in granite and, and concrete, as well as allowing the geniuses of, of the past. This is a challenge for older areas like Cambridge and Paris uh, and London. But I think it's a challenge that needs to be met and needs to be met somewhere in the sensible middle not with either radical uh, tearing down of older areas, but not with a complete uh, desire to, to, to favor the past at the expense of the future. Because if we're going to uh, allow our children to afford to live in these places, we're actually going to need to provide the space for them, to, for them to live. The costs of not doing this are particularly large, of course, in the developing world, where Mumbai has you know, had an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily tough land use regulation for um, forever. And I think one of the reasons why this is so important 
is that there's nothing greener than blacktop. And I think I'll, I'll end on, I've just got two things I want to I want to end on. One of which is, is uh, I'll just tell a quick story about, about uh, a young Harvard graduate in 1844 uh, that some of you may know. But there was a, a young Harvard graduate and a friend in 1844 who went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord. They did some fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when they came to cook a chowder, uh, the, flame, the, the, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby tall grass, and a fiery conflagration started. And by the time the fire, the, the inferno had ended, more than 300 prime acres of Concord woodland had burned to the dust. Okay? This was an extraordinarily destructive moment uh, in, in, uh, Concord, in Concord history. Um, the young, the young Harvard graduate, of course, was Henry David Thoreau, the modern secular saint of environmentalism, who did far more harm to his, his local environment than anyone I can think of who lived in Boston during the same time period. The reason that I tell this message is not to be mean to Thoreau, who is, of course, a wonderful writer that we've all learned from, but in fact because there's a deeper lesson here. We are a destructive species. If you love nature, stay away from it. Right? I know this myself. I do a lot more harm to nature when, now that I live in a suburb than I did when I lived three blocks away from here. Um, and um, this is, you know, there's statistics on this about the, the significant difference in carbon emissions between cities and, and, and suburban areas. And I think this is another reason why, why, we, should cherish, uh, why we should cherish our cities. Um, I, I want to end on one just last point, which is that there is actually also a policy point of this book. It's, it's a book of, that celebrates cities, but it's also a book that's a challenge. And it's a challenge to uh, the mistaken view that, you know, America needs anti-urban policies, that America only exists in its, its suburban homes. It's a challenge to the view that we need to subsidize the heck out of home ownership. Right? And I, I'm very happy that the president in the, in the budget called for a reduction in the home mortgage interest reduction and the housing finance reform plan count, called for a reduction in Freddie Mae and Freddie, Freddie Mac subsidies because we need this. Subsidizing home ownership, and I've been told I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go over this quickly. Subsidizing home ownership means pushing people out of urban apartments into suburban homes, and that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We should also rethink, and, and I give the president lower marks for this, his fetish for transportation infrastructure. Okay, uh, we do not need more roads in low density areas. The stimulus package spent, you know, spent infrastructure spending two to one on our least dense areas than on our most dense areas. That makes no sense to me either, right? There's no reason why we need to be subsidizing people to, to go outside. Each new highway that we came into a city in the post-war period reduced its its population by 18 percent relative to the metropolitan area. Okay, these are these are forces for for deurbanizing, and most importantly, we need to rethink our local schooling system. In some sense, the you know the greatest incentive for many parents like myself to move outside of, of cities is, is to get a different school system for, for, their, for their children. There's no reason why cities you know, can't have uniformly good schools. The same powers of competition and innovation that work in the private sector can work for, for schools as, as well. But we need to have reform in this. Right? There's a sense in which we've, what we've done with schooling is, is as if we've decided to handle, handle food by giving all restaurants in Cambridge or Boston over to a single food superintendent who would operate canteens and deliver us exactly what we want to eat on a, on a daily basis, right? Unsurprisingly, the, rest, the, the restaurant quality would be awful in that case, right? Restaurants are good because there's constant competition, constant innovation. You know, the great success that we've seen in, in, from many of the, of the more nimble schools suggests that you know, reform along this area is, is appropriate. So let me end by, by thanking you very much for coming, and thank you very much for, for, for your attention. And now I have some time, I guess, for, for a few questions. but. Um, I guess I'm, I've probably got a five, five, about five minutes for, for, for questions, but thank you. Thank you again. So, yeah. No, I, I, don't think there's, I, I don't think there's an optimal size, for the size, of, size of the city, and I don't think that, that there's, an, you know, and, and let me just be clear about, about what I'm advocating, at least in terms of policy, right? It's not that I'm advocating that any person should change their lifestyle because of what I'm suggesting. What, what I'm suggesting is that we should unleash unleash our cities, that we should stop, you know, pushing people outside of them and stop over-regulating them and start thinking about how to, how to deliver better schools uh, for the children in, in urban areas. Um, so I mean, I, I think there are, you know, there are people who don't want to live in skyscrapers and never will, and God bless them, and that's, that's, just, that's just fine. Um, in terms of the optimal size of the size of city, it depends so much on the, on the culture, on the economics of the, of the area, on the transportation technology that's, that's available. Um, I, you know, if there's, a, if there's a lesson about optimal size here, it's, it's more that, that there are you know the, the the difference between there's an option between building up and building out right and there are lots of times where building up makes a lot more sense than building out from many many uh, perspectives so uh, that's in, that's I think the, the strongest thing that I would say on this and again we're not trying to subsidize building up we're just trying to eliminate the barriers that stop uh, that stop building up 
you know, it's uh, th there clearly is a need for a mixed model here, right? I mean, I think I think it's it's you can't argue that in a city like Detroit, that public education as it currently is working is, you know, doing its job for the children. I mean, I just can't see how one can possibly look at the current model and the and think that it works. And the the overwhelming evidence from decades of work of thinking that if you just throw more money at the problem, it works, that's a non-starter. Okay, that's just a non, you know, we've had, you know, 30 years of evidence on this suggesting that that doesn't work. On the other hand, you know, there are a lot of charter schools that have proven to be remarkably successful. These are things that are highly publicly managed, and a lot of them aren't, but that's exactly the point, right? I mean, is that the, the, it's not as if every restaurant that opens is, is good. I mean, a lot of them fail and they close, and, and, that's, and that's the way that, the, way that the, market, the market works. I think you need to be careful about where you think this will work. I think you need to highly regulate it. I think a lot of it can happen within the, within the public system. I'm not in any sense suggesting a deregulated thing where we're going to re rely on the free market to educate our children in a completely private manner. I'm, I'm just arguing that in many areas our, our public school systems are, are not succeeding. And there's plenty of evidence that, you know, lots of innovation is actually helpful in this area. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that this is coming from ideology. This is coming from, you know, what we've actually seen in terms of test scores, in terms of, of many of the schools. So, but, you know, reasonable minds are free to, are free to disagree on, on this. But, I, I mean, I think the, the advantages of innovation are great. Mr. Culver. You know, I, I, I believe above all in spatial neutrality, uh, right? I mean, I believe that, that we shouldn't be taxing one area to benefit another area. I, I believe that in terms of, you know, we shouldn't be taxing successful areas to give them to less successful areas. We certainly shouldn't be taxing rural areas to artificially subsidize, up, artificially subsidize cities. That is, the, that is the overriding principle of, of what I believe in. That being said, there, there is an issue in that different areas need different things. And that's part of the problem when we often try to equalize spending for each different public service, right? So a growing area actually does need new infrastructure. A declining area typically does not, right? So you need to figure out ways to do this that are either essentially charging the growing area for the, for the infrastructure, you know, making the growing area pay for its own, as indeed Boston did when it, you know, drained the Back Bay, right? I mean, the, the Back Bay is paid for in part by the land that's being created by, by draining the area. It's the local area providing its own, uh, paying for its own, own service. Um, or you have more equalization across different areas. So, you know, you provide transportation funding for Phoenix, and you provide education funding for Detroit, right? I mean, that, that, sort, of, that sort of model where you have something that's forms of an equalization. But I, I, there's no, there's n you know, nothing, nothing in terms of spatial favor, I mean, I believe in nothing in terms of spatial favoritism, but I do believe in actually having sensible policies that are, you know, that do even things out across multiple categories or that use user fees or local charges to make things work. Yes, sir? Do you think Unfortunately, I don't see a long-run alternative to it. I mean, it's not I mean, healthy. Is not the way I would phrase it. I mean, it's not. It's not that I. You know, it's not that I welcome deindustrialization. We have a tremendous problem in this country, right? I mean, uh, the unemployment rate among people who have college degrees is less than five percent. The unemployment rate among high school dropouts is over fifteen percent, right? I mean, it's it's an enormous problem that this country faces in terms of creating jobs, finding employment for those people who have less basic skills. Um, I mean, that's one of the solutions to this. The long-run solution to this is is figuring out ways to invest more wisely in human capital is to make our education system uh, stronger. And I, I certainly believe very strongly in the, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever form of salesmanship you, need, you want to use for it, the Sputnik moment or whatever, anything, anything that's needed to, to, you know, have America recognize that the future of our country depends upon its human capital couldn't be, couldn't be more vital. Um, that being said, uh, you know, it's, I think, important also to think about ways in which we can ease the employment of those people who have less skills. I think that's also one reason, though, why I'm bullish on cities, right? I think one of the things that, that, that uh, you know, this is, again, the sort of inequality at the local level isn't all bad, that there's actually a plus to having rich and poor together in, in urban areas, and there's no plus to having the artificial segregation of areas in which you have, you know, all the poor people in one place and all the rich people in one place, so they all look equal when you show up there, but it's nothing, it's providing nothing but separation. And I do think that, you know, in some sense, the great hope is that smart entrepreneurial people at all levels of education will figure out ways to make all Americans more productive in, in the years ahead. And I mean, I think that's certainly the hope. And I think that actually spatial concentration is one tool for that. But it's not a, it's not a silver bullet. And there's no promise.
that that will necessarily deliver everything. But it it certainly seems wiser to me than the alternative, which is to favor you know all the skilled guys in one place and all the less skilled guys in the other place. And that's again why why I like more housing in in areas that are full of full of skilled people is to create more opportunities for more people to be around e each other and to learn from one another and to provide opportunities for other people. Well, wait a minute. The, the, the Zips law, right? So Zips law, which which I guess the most the easiest way to explain it is that the the second largest city is typically is half the size of the first largest city, it's, and the third largest size is typically the, the the size of the third is one third the size of the largest largest city. Um, and it's it's from a statistical point of view, it's highly related to uh, Gibrat's law for cities, which is that urban growth is roughly you know the proportional urban growth is roughly independent of initial city size. That's another fact that that's uh, that that's that that's those two things are related in a, in a mathematical sense. Um, that doesn't mean that city sizes have been growing astronomically over time. Right, so your starting point, which is that the, the distribution continues to follow the same statistical distribution, but it's marching farther and farther, 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 farther out. Right, so we have far more cities of five million or more in this world than we did uh, 50 years ago. I mean, that's that's pushed out out enormously, um, and the the. Of course, you know, in any urban area, there's a balance between the positives of density and the downsides of density, and those things are those things are, are going together. And and there's a there's a point at which you know it's not obvious that you know we're going to get 100 million person cities. I mean, I can't I can't predict that, and that's not obviously going to happen. So I think your your question is is reasonable. But I think from any you know if you look across metropolitan gross metropolitan product right across the U.S. per capita, it's an enormously positive strong relationship between that and the size of the metropolitan area. If you look across countries, Countries, of course, you know the average GDP for countries that are, have more than half of the people in cities is more than five times the GDP of, of countries that have less than half of the people in cities. That doesn't mean that urbanization is causing prosperity, but unquestionably, connecting in cities is is part of the development the development process. So, um, you know, I think I think the literature favoring the view that you know there's there's a tremendous productivity advantage of being around others. Other, other people is enormously strong. That being said, there are lots of smaller cities, particularly cities with lots of educated people that manage to be perfectly productive and perfectly successful. And again, you know, the goal here is not one uniform style of city or one uniform style of life. It's to, it's to allow the freedom that allows different types of, of areas to grow and that just that doesn't hold back our most successful cities either by over-regulating or particularly in the developing world failing to provide the crucially needed public services that are, that are part, of these, part of these areas. If, if you want to make the case that we should move from the current tax system to a consumption tax that basically doesn't tax any form of investment, I'm with you for that, okay, like most economists. I'm, I couldn't be more with you to eliminating the, the, you know, the tax barriers that, that reduce people from investing more. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all on top of that. But why in the world we should privilege one type of savings over all the other makes absolutely no sense to me. On top of it, how can it possibly make, if, you're, if your goal is to incentivize savings, why do it through an incentive that subsidizes borrowing? The size of the in incentive scales up with the amount of leverage that you take on. It's not, it's not taking, scaling up the value of the house or the amount of money that you're putting down on the house. You have every incentive to take every penny of equity that you've accumulated out of the house and borrow it. Right? What we've seen over the past 10 years in terms of this great boom-bust cycle, I think suggests that it's absolute madness that we have a government policy that bribes our citizens to leverage themselves to, the bet on the, to bet to the hilt on housing prices. How can that possibly make sense? Sure, it's swell to think that it might lead to an ownership society. It seems to me just as likely to be leading towards a foreclosure society. And it's hardly as if housing is a particularly productive or obvious source of value over the long run. Stocks have historically done much better over the long run in terms of gaining value than housing prices than housing prices have. Um, it's not obvious that housing is a particularly you know fertile form of uh, uh, of investment. And the way that we structure this this investment is particularly odd, right? I mean, the fact that we you know we scale it up with the size of the house, which in induces people to uh, build larger houses, which doesn't make particular sense in in a, you know an area in which any anyone worries about carbon emissions. The two reasons why, of course. Carbon emissions are lower in cities than outside them, even holding constant income and family size, is less driving in cities and smaller homes. Those are the two big reasons why you have this carbon advantage. Of course, the feds are pushing against that by inducing people to buy bigger, bigger homes. It's wildly regressive, even among homeowning households. The work of, of uh, Paterba and Sinai finds that the average benefit to families earning $250,000 or more is more than 10 times the benefit accruing to families earning between forty and seventy-five thousand, uh, forty and seventy-five thousand dollars. And if you think the point of the the thing is to actually maximize home ownership, which I'm not sure why we particularly want to do, given that. 
you know, I think people should be free to choose whatever form of, of home they, they want. It's also really poorly designed at, to do it because the benefits accrue disproportionately to people who are going to be buying homes anyway. It's not actually accruing to the middle income people who are actually on the margin between owning and not owning. And while we're talking about, you know, subsidizing home ownership, let's just sort of remember why this is so anti-urban. The critical fact here is that more than 85 percent of single family detached houses are owner occupied. More than 85 percent of multifamily dwellings in larger, in larger buildings are rented. Okay? There are good reasons for this. When you rent out a single family detached home, the renter usually doesn't take very good care of it. And typically homes depreciate by 1% a year if they're rented out. On the other hand, it's often very hard to have a lot of co-op or condo owners under a, under a single roof. Anyone who's ever dealt with a co-op board Right? has got to have a sense of how difficult it is to get all these owners into one, into one uh, thing, uh, you know, even with small numbers. I have friends who have dealt with their Cambridge co-op co boards for years in various running battles over, over uh, various, various things. Having one roof, one owner makes a lot, lot of sense. But if you're going to say that high-density, multi-story multi buildings are naturally rented, and low-density buildings are naturally owned, then a national fetish for home ownership is saying, pushing everybody out of the high-density dwellings in cities into the low-density dwellings in suburbs. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I just cannot tell you how much I hope that you know the Tea Party lives up to their push for freedom on this issue and says that you know it's time for America to stop socially engineering uh, and stop, stop pushing, you know, Americans into a particular lifestyle that, you know, just happens to, you know, be what, um, uh, what the nanny state wants. So um, one, I think we have time for one, one last question. Yes, sir. Well, I think if you, if you look at, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the, the job of redistribution, let's be clear about this. I mean, I, I think that actually in providing homes and providing restaurants, maybe even to a certain extent in, in providing at least some innovation in education. I think there's a lot to like in, in, in freedom and competition, right? There's a lot to like in, in those things which actually thrive and thrive in cities. When it comes to actually taking care of the bottom fifth of the American population, the free market doesn't do that naturally. There's no, there's no pro natural profit imperative which actually takes care of them. They can lift the natural economy to a certain extent, but you know, oftentimes innovations promote inequality or, or impoverish the bottom fifth as much as, as you know, hurting them. I think that's why we should believe in, in the role of, a, of a, you know, a, a sensible, caring state that actually you know, does something for, for the people at the bottom, and particularly the children, and make sure that they, they have some sort of a future. You know, in the case of, say, housing, I would much rather have some you know, sensible, portable form of Section 8 housing vouchers that was more widely, widely available than thinking that I'm going to monkey around with this through the home mortgage interest deduction, right? I mean, as I said, the home mortgage interest deduction is wildly regressive. In terms of the proposal that I myself have made in terms of, of the home mortgage interest deduction, I, I've just suggested lowering the upper cap of the deduction from a million to 300,000 by 100,000 a year, which is not something that will affect anybody of the population that you're talking about, right? There, there's no sense in which that will do anything, anything for that, for that group. The truth be told is if I, I was being, you know, even more unrealistic politically, I'd probably go further than that. But I, I'm with you in terms of, of, you know, Section 8 housing vouchers and doing, doing things to take care of the people at, at the bottom. Um, buses are a great technology, and we want to be smart about that. We want, we want to be smart about making sure that people can get around without a car uh, for every, every adult. You know, as you perhaps have gleaned, I'm also very fond of that other great 19th century uh, uh, technology, the elevator, right? Also a very good technology when combined with walking, right? This is this is the one thing that beats, uh, you know, a 25-minute car commute is a, you know, four-minute pedestrian walk involving a couple of elevators on, on every end. I think that's a that's a nice thing as well. But you know, by all means, you know, this is this is this is this is critical, and it's also critical that we remember that local governments can't take care of redistribution. Right? There's, there is no natural way in which a city can do its job in terms of taking care of the bottom fifth. Right? There's just an, an, an unavoidable logic that if you try to play Robin Hood too strongly at the local level, that firms and wealthy people just leave. Right? We've seen this over and over again. The, the natural you know, implication of that, of course, is not that you don't want to have any redistribution, but you want to have a sensible national policy that actually takes care of people, but that doesn't, doesn't count on local governments to do that. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not that you shouldn't take from that that I'm urging any local government to do less. I'm not doing that. But I'm just saying that that, you know, many local governments that tried to do this have been hit very, very hard by the by the emigration. And that's a that's a difficult thing to uh, to deal with. And I think it calls for a um, you know, I think it calls it has calls for us to recognize that if we do care about redistribution, it has to be done. Okay. So so the one form of public investment that 
it has been shown uncontrovertibly to have a massive impact on urban success is the presence of a land-grant college in the area. Land-grant colleges, and this is work by Enrico Moretti, I've also done a little bit following Enrico's lead, are enormously strongly correlated with urban success in the modern era. Right. Enormously strongly correlated with both wages and population growth. Of course, we've got our own land grant college here in Ma here in Cambridge. It's called MIT. Uh, it's it's done a remarkable job in terms of generating entrepreneurship in the in the local area. But you know, uh, try to imagine Minneapolis without the University of Minnesota. Try to imagine you know uh, so many cities that are successful without these these colleges. And you know, this again gets to the question that was asked previously about about public schooling. What's what's needed here is is you know a hybrid model. You know what's needed here is not some sense that you only, we only get private institution. I mean, Harvard founded by the state, right? I mean, it's not a it's not a private initiative. It's a it's a it's a public thing. But these these institutions are stronger because they actually also compete with each other because they actually are in a national market where they're, where they're competing for each other. And there, there is certainly at the local level a very strong connection between, you know, se between, between those schools and, and local success. At the, at the local level, um, so the, the compulsory schooling laws certainly did have a, raising those did in fact have significant impacts on, on, on wages in, in the areas as well. On that side. So let me, let me end there. And again, thank you very much all for your, for your time. <laughs>